Good morning and welcome to today's Talking Cafe Live. I'm procrastinating just to make sure that we are all in and attached and going out live. Um, today we are covering the National Storytelling Week and we are really lucky we have got an award-winning author, Neil Griffith. He's coming on and he's going to be uh, not only giving tips and advice on how to encapsulate the children as you're telling stories, but he's going to read a small story at the end. And we have David Rose from Red Robin Books, who publishes wonderful books, including uh, Neil's books. As usual, I'm going to start with my poem to encapsulate what today is going to be about. So, books for children, hip hip hooray, stories to read make a child's day. Reading to children can be such fun, this is something you must not shun. Create a quiet reading place, act out a story at your own pace. Play a game around the book, capture the children's enwrapped look. Reading boosts creativity, this will help them grow, as you'll see. Get them engrossed when you read. Show them that it is fun indeed. Enhance the love for reading a book. Have fun and grow in your reading nook. So I'd like to now introduce both Neil, she says, and David, who you probably met back in May. Welcome back. Um, good morning to you both. Good morning. Right. Sorry, Sorry David. David, I have you on mute. Good morning. And I'm going to have to play with the uh, mics today because of feedback. And it, it seems to work if I silence one of them. So if we do one at a time, we seem to be OK. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to silence myself so that uh, Neil and David can talk to you. Good morning, Good morning everybody. everybody. Okay, David, over to you at the moment. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm David Rose. I run Red, Run, Red Robin Books, and we're based in here in Somerset, just outside Langport. Um, we have been on before, back in the summer, um, where Neil did a, a session talking about how to tell stories better and read some stories, I believe, I can remember. Uh, so we're going to do that again today. In Neil's just going to remind you a little bit about uh, how to tell stories better uh, for your children, um, some techniques, and then he'll finish with a story uh, right at the end, uh, which we hope will entertain you all. So um, I'm not going to say an awful lot. I'm just going to let Neil do what Neil does. Back to you, Wendy. <laughs> OK, here we go. As you can see, I'm getting my cursor to work to make the, to try and operate the mic so that we uh, stop the feedback. Um, Kizzy's come in and said good morning. I'm hoping she can hear now. Um, she has put that she couldn't hear. So just keeping an eye on the comments box. I'm looking clear. So really, um, over to uh, Neil. I'm going to start you off with a really basic question is, why are the stories so important? You know, why? Why is this? Yeah. Well, um, I get asked this question probably every single day of, of why becoming a reader is so important. Um, and the first thing I always say, which is an instant reaction, is because it's wonderful when you're a reader. And you think, are there any other possible reasons you would need? But of course there are. And once a child becomes a reader, the first thing we do know um, and every piece of statistic proves this, is that children who become avid readers are those who do best educationally. Um, and, and I also like to say to children, if you become a reader, your brain is going to become bigger. Um, inevitably, it's going to become bigger because you will um, fill it with so many facts and fiction and dreams and and moments of imagination that your brain is going to get bigger. 
And I always like to say at the beginning of this sort of question is that the reason that I became an avid reader and then an avid story writer is because, and I will show you a picture, there I am being read to by the most important person in my life, my lovely dad, who was a single parent. And do you like the hair that I used to have? Wasn't I gorgeous and cute? I was. Don't, I was Wendy. Really really no, no, I won't. won't. But right, you're right. thinking it. And so um, I was very lucky. From a very tiny baby, I was read to every single night. And I caught the bug of reading. But when children are exposed to, to stories read aloud well, what we, we almost instantly notice when they arrive in school is that their language ability is that much better because they have been exposed to rich vocabulary of every type. And you actually get most of your vocabulary um, from being read to or talked to. So we know, well, what's sad is that we know fewer children before lockdown were being read to than ever before. It was as low as one in five children were being read to um, regularly. Um, we've got we've got a little, is that a question coming in? I heard something then. Not sure. Okay, I'll keep it going. Was, but we have got, lovely to see you, Neil. My girls and I really love your books. There we go. So we already have a fan on. Itchy oh. is a firm favourite. Oh, and Itchy Bear is my top bestseller. I never imagined that I would become famous for a bear with an itchy bottom, but there you go. <laughs> um, so we knew that before lockdown, only about one in five children were being read to regularly by their parents. We also knew <clears throat> that there had been a dramatic drop in talk in homes between um, adults and children. And that's because we don't eat meals together in the way we used to. We, we often aren't together as a family uh, as regularly as we once were. Now I sense that during lockdown, many parents have been reading to their children and I hope that will stick. I hope that will become a habit. But when, when you are being read to, you know, I, I remember as a little boy just sat there dreaming um, and a, a question that often children say to me is, where do you get your ideas, you know, when I'm writing stories? And I go, when I was dreaming as a little boy, because that's what I did. My dad was so good at reading stories, and also he made up stories in the car on long journeys. <clears throat> he was very clever at doing that. But those ideas were in there, and many of my stories are based on little moments that I had with my dad when he was reading stories to me. So it enriches you as a whole person. And But I, I just go back to that bit of saying, can you think of anything nicer than loving a story? And those moments, at the moment I'm reading um, Simon Reeve, who's on the TV, his autobiography, and it's one of those lovely moments. I don't want it to end. I don't want his story to end because it's just so gripping. And that love, or when you're reading a story and you think, well, how is this going to end this book? How on earth is it going to end? And that's a very magical feeling. And so, you know, the greatest gift you can give a child is to get them motivated to read. I agree. Um Sometimes I actually hate coming to the end of a book because I know it's going to finish. Um, yes. I read it so fast to absorb it all, but I don't want it to finish. So it really is, you know. There's almost a moment of loneliness when it's over. You think, well, hang on a minute, you know, because it becomes such a part of you at that time you're reading it. Yes, I say, I'm fortunate like you that I was raised... Um, the fact that I'm the youngest of seven and so my older siblings would always invent stories, read books and like you, I was very fortunate and that's my childhood memories too, yeah. uh, was of the right. It's, um, so when's the best time to read a story for children? I mean, we always had it at bedtime, most of the time was bedtime or rainy days. Not, we didn't happen so often on a sunny day well what's interesting a few years ago 
I spent 24 hours um, telling stories, and it was called Any Time, Any Place, Anywhere. And I set a challenge in Swindon, where I live. I said to anyone, if you uh, email us and say you'd like a story, and it's a wacky and weird place, I don't care what time of the day, I will come and do it. And so for 24 hours, I did not stop. And I was being hurtled from place to place by a taxi driver. I did it dangling on a crane for builders in a building site. I did it up a tree and we actually had to get the fire service because I could get up, but I couldn't get back down. I was stuck. I did it on a train coming into a station. I did. And so the, the truth is you can do it anywhere um, and you can do it at any time, but there are best times. And that often has to reflect the patterns of family life. Um, and, and there are kind of different types of story. There's the snuggly cuddly, there's the going wild, um, and traditionally, because it fits into the pattern of life, stories are at night time and that's often snuggly, but it doesn't have to be snuggly. What I loved about my dad is that sometimes I walked into my bedroom for my story and he'd set a scene up on the bed and we actually performed it with sheets over our heads. And uh, but, but traditionally night time, but I would say many families have told me they enjoy, you know, a breakfast. They actually like to have a story to start the day. Um, in school, one of the things I say to teachers is please do not do story time at the end of the day because it's rushed. They never leave enough time. Everybody's tired. And so you have this five minute flash of a story and it's the worst time imaginable. So I suggest if you want to know the, the best time school day wise, we know that the best moment to read a story is mid-morning because the children's interest levels are on fire by that point and you as an adult are also, you've woken, you've got over early morning and, and you're ready to go for it. But what I would say is if, if you're in home, choose the moment you know that it can be focused um, and you know there's that space because it's no point just shoving it in with the telly on. I mean, I've seen horrendous time. Telly's on, you know, the, the cooker's buzzing in the background. That, no point. It's a total waste. It has to be as magical as you can make it. Now, I'm not pretending that, you know, if you have a family of five, that it's easy to find magical moments. But I would say to you, you chose to have five children, so you've got to work with it. Because I do, I do have parents who almost get a bit cross. I've got five children. What's that got to do with me? You made a decision and you have to work with that. And no, it's not always easy. And I think you also have to sense your child's mood because we know that sometimes you just think there's no point for a story. They're just not focused. And a lot of parents, and actually there are teachers who say that when they try and do a story time, the children aren't ready. And as a teacher, I know that children are not ready for an en masse story as a class till they're about four or five at the, at, the, at the youngest. I wouldn't go any younger than that. I would only have small groups younger than that. But you, you've got to sense, is this a good time to have a story? Are we settled? Do we want it? And there's, there's no magic wand, by the way. Because I think some people, in fact, if you knew the emails I get, you know, my child's hyperactive, he's this, he's that, he's that, that. I can't, I don't have a magic wand because there is human nature in there. And boys find it much more difficult to listen to a story, not always, but it's a strong pattern. And that's because boys mature slightly later than girls. And also their concentration spans are not as good as girls, uh, usually. They do catch up, but, you know, there is an issue with boys. It, it can be hard work. And if you think this is unbearable and my child's just rolling all over the floor, give in. Um, but also make the story time short, you know. They say that children's concentration spans are equal to their age in minutes. So a five-year-old, if you have five minutes, you're flipping lucky. But if you're imaginative and work at it, you can extend it longer. Um, so choose the time that just works for you. And also, don't feel we have to do a story time every day. We have to, because otherwise, 
don't do a story when you know it's not going to be enjoyed. You, you, you're just wasting part of the day. Choose your moments and and stick in, hang on in there, because some children appear not to be listening, but you start to get good at it, and they get better at better at enjoying the story. And one little thing I'd also say at this point, we know that stories are better on a one-to-one -one in homes. Um, they're much more effective than when you put brothers and sisters together, because A, they're usually different ages, and it's very hard to target the range of ages, and also they distract each other. Now I know that parents who are gonna say, I've got four children. Again, you've got to, if you can, spread those stories out. That doesn't mean they can't sometimes have stories together, but if they could also have their little unique moment, because it's magic, it's their little story time, and that has much more power and effect than an en masse brawl. Yeah, yeah. And different stories will capture different children's imagination, uh, which means, whereas, as you rightly say, the boy might like a pirate swashbuckling, whereas the girl wants the unicorn. Although that's changing, it's really it changing. It is totally changing, and, and it depends on the mood, as you say, uh, you know, if you're wanting them to calm down are you getting ready for the the play acting afterwards are you yeah so as you say is, i hadn't actually thought because when my grandchildren are together i do tend we do tend to sit together and you're right they wind each other up um but it's but life is pressured and you know, I understand the issue of time. I, I do understand that, but there is there is not a wand that can make that change. You know, it, it, I'm just saying as it is, if, if they can sometimes have stories separately, that would have a huge impact. Yes, you're right. Give them their moment, as you rightly say. If you understand what you're saying, it, yeah, it's made me stop and think. So it's obviously working. <laughs> <laughs> so... And I suppose, what should children read? How do you know what is how do, you know how does a mum, as you say, they're juggling life, they've been bought books, they've had presents. How do you know what's appropriate for that child? How would you sort of gauge? Okay, Be before I come to that, which I was straight away, um, another question linked to the one before is: they often say, "Who can tell stories?" The answer is anyone. Anyone can but some parents are not as confident as others. Um, but it's the same with teachers. I, I tell a story, and it's sadly true, and I'm slightly ashamed, but when I was a head teacher, there was a very young teacher in his first year of teaching in my school, and I went past his classroom, and he was doing a story time, and it was like a dying wasp. I thought there was a hornet's nest. And when he said, I'm going to do two more chapters, I thought, no, you're not. And I pressed the fire alarm because we hadn't had a practice, which I know is wicked. But I thought, those poor children, this is torture. And so I sat with him and I said, look, I'm going to... In fact, what I did to help him, I videoed him and he went, oh, I'm awful. I went, yeah, you are. But we worked at it together. And I've proved that I can almost give anyone the confidence to tell a story. And a lot of parents say, but I can't do it, I can't do it. And it's usually because you're not doing it. The more you go for it, the better you get, I promise. And you may be shy. And, and there's a lot of parents, and I, I do, I, I'm surprised at this. They say I'm shy of doing it in front of my own children. Now, I can imagine a librarian in a library doing it in front of 30 children might get a bit shy. <clears throat> but anyone can tell a story. And what's vital is we get more men reading to children. We have a huge issue in this country with reading still being seen as a more female than male activity. And if you look at the figures, it's nearly it's largely mothers who are taking the big load of reading to their children. Now, if you have a son, what is absolutely vital is that a son hears a male voice reading stories to them as well as a female. Now, luckily, I had a dad, but at school, I had wonderful Mrs. Jones. For two years, she was my teacher. And, oh, she had a wonderful Welsh voice. <clears throat> I just, I was in love with her, and I was only four. But she was <laughs> magical. 
So anyone can do it and you get better, you do get better. And don't be frightened that you have to read every word. If you want to make up bits as you're going along, the children normally say, it didn't say that. And you go, I know, I know, but it was fun. You know, and try and relax into that role. But back to your, your next question, which is what should children read? It might be, ought to be, what shouldn't they read? Should have been your question. Mm. Because I have, um, I've got 25 God children and I don't want any more. So viewers, viewers and listeners, don't ask me to be a godfather again because it costs me a fortune. My oldest one is 48 and my youngest one is six months. No more. I'm at my limit. But um, I'm obviously buying material for those children all the time. My life is spent buying books and but what, what I've learned is I only ever say no to a child if who are asking for a book when I know it's got adult inappropriate content. Because I was in Waterstones, and this wasn't with one of my godchildren, this was with just a child, and they had picked up a pop-up book about the Titanic. And I, even I went, oh, like that, because I couldn't help it. I just thought, oh, fabulous, the Titanic in pop-up. And his mother said, put that back because you're just going to read it and i thought to myself well what does he normally do if he doesn't read it is he back to people to death with the book but i never say no to a child and and what i do is i do a little sound and my godchildren all know this i go oh, oh and they go uncle neil that's for adults isn't it and i go sorry you can't have that one because what is really important is that we try not to control too much what children read because the minute you start to control it as an adult you are switching them off you are removing any motivation because you imagine you're all excited and then someone says no you're not having it and what children often do and this worries parents when they're choosing books they sometimes choose the same book again and again and again and you have to practice the face and it's this <laughs> oh look we're gonna have the hungry caterpillar again now what you're actually thinking is i'd like to smash the hungry caterpillar, caterpillar's face in but if children don't have favorites you are taking their reading history and they need to have a history and mine was wind in the willows i wanted it again and my dad never said no so they'll often choose the same book again and again and that's good because they become favourites and it builds their motivation. Then sometimes, and I've heard the number of parents, why are you choosing that book? It's for babies. Put, put that back. How dare you? What they actually were doing is choosing a book that they know they can read without any stuttering, any mistakes. And what they're looking for is a book they know they can read straight through without straining on every word. And that, again, builds their confidence. So never say baby book, because that's humiliating. But often the opposite happens. They choose a book that's too hard, and they don't yet have that reading ability. If, they, if that happens, you don't go, oh, you will never read that. Again, you're knocking their confidence. You say, oh, I'm going to read that with you, which actually means you'll help them through it. But in terms of what, what did you... It's so difficult because I've got a magazine here, which I'll show you, Earth Mover Monthly. Now, I have to say, Earth Mover Monthly might not do a lot for you, Wendy. But if I tell you the number of children that because of that magazine, they are hooked. Because I went into a school in London and I, I love Earth Movers. And I do get this magazine and I'm not slightest bit embarrassed. I love it. And a little boy saw it and he went, excuse me, is that about diggers? And I went, yes. He said, but I love diggers. And I said, well, come. He said, so does my friend Martin. I said, well, go and get Martin. So Martin comes over. And of course, we then had 50 children. Well, that school buys Earth Mover every month. So do thousands of school because that's what turned that little lad on. You know, it was that was the, the switch. And, and I don't mind what children read as long as it's appropriate. Um, but they were, and, and don't always go for traditional books because they like the back of cereal boxes. They love the Argos catalogue. 
which I think they're going to stop doing. But children love the Argus catalogue. You know, reading is reading is reading. And a lot of children prefer non-fiction material to fiction. What's the problem? We do want all children to be exposed to both. But if you've got, and it came, there is a pattern here, boys love non-fiction. To me, if they're reading, they're reading. And that's all I need. They will come to other material later. You know, and, it, and a lot of parents say, all he reads is football. And I go, fabulous, because he's reading. So allow children some control over what they read. But that doesn't mean that you can't suggest things as well. Of course you can. And if you've discovered your child gets hooked on something, because there's a little fairy series. Now, I wish one of my goddaughters hadn't seen them, to be frank with you, because there are 49 in the series. Mm -hmm. It has cost me a fortune. And that woman who writes them, they're rainbow fairies. She's still doing it. I hate her. But I, do I care, really? Because she is absolutely hooked. So give them some, some control and space as well as suggesting things. My, My grand 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 you mentioned, mentioned he, when, when he comes here, we have um, our mornings. Um, he picks a subject and we use the iPad, funny enough, because most of the time I don't hold any material on what it is he's asking. So he will have learned or heard something or and he will then say to me, can you tell me more about this? So we go together. If I've got the books, we'll go to the books. If not, we go to the iPad or the laptop and we find out information. And as you, you're right, he, funnily enough, he is very factual. And boys, I mean, I, I don't want people to think I'm saying only boys love, you know, diggers, because actually there are a lot of girls that love that magazine. But there are patterns. For whatever reason, there are patterns and stereotypes. Um, but, you know, some of the magazines that I've shown children, the Goat Milkers Monthly. Now, to be honest, I don't know why I had the Goat Milkers Monthly, but I did. And th this is a bit naughty, but this little boy came up to me. His name was Oliver. He said, did you know that goats get a rash on their teats? Well, it's not something that crossed my mind, to be frank with you. But, you know, you, it's, I love it when children come up. You know, I handled it well. But I love it if they're interested in things, you know. It's good. It's good. So reading is just so enormous. And we're so lucky, you know, because you and I, when we were at school, we certainly didn't have the range of reading material. Obviously, Wendy, you're much younger than me, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you're right. We, we were, and, and we had lots of, as you say, second hand. They got passed around because yeah. I've got so many older siblings. I remember having to wait. She, my sister would read me a story. Um, and get me really engrossed and then be really awful and tease me and not read me anymore. Oh, nasty. She'd say, no, you can wait now. And, and she knew she was amazing at telling stories. Um, and <clears throat> she could do all the sound effects. Oh, and no. I can remember she'd, she'd come in of a night time, read my bedtime story and leave me horrified about spiders and with all the sound effects and, and then she'd say good night, sleep tight. And she used to, she used to really, and and in that, in actual fact, she was probably the one that got me wanting more because she would always leave me hanging for the next night. She'd build up a crescendo and then stop. Yeah. Say, what a lovely sister. Now, yes, she as I say, she's she was always quite pushy with my all of my education. Actually, that one she got me, she got me doing her sums um, at an early age so that she could n nip off out. You know, so but she did my my education wonders. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we've covered sort of where to read, what to read. I guess. Um, can I can I come in with with one little thing I, I I wanted to say is if you want to get your children reading, there are, there are three tips of which we've covered two. Um, one is to give them choice and freedom, and one is to read aloud to them regularly. But what is probably more vital before anything, if you want your children 
to love reading, they have to come from homes where they see other adults reading themselves. We know that that is one of the biggest indicators of success as a reader, that's not, not always all the adults, but there was someone that was a reader. And of course, for children who are lucky enough that both mum and dad, brothers and sisters, those important people in their lives, grandmas, grandpas, they're seen reading and it's almost infectious because, you know, and when you're reading and there's a child, I mean, I can't, I do it every time, it's just natural now. If I think a child's watching me, I was on the train um, last year, the year before last, and I was reading and a child was watching me. And of course, I started to look delicious as I read that story. I sound a bit perverted, but it wasn't. And it was like, oh, and I was making little noises. Oh, no. Oh, I wanted them to look and think, oh, that looks good. I want to try that. You know, you've got to be a role model. You know, it's very hard. You know, I, I recently met um, a lady who said, my parents never read to me, but thank goodness for one of my teachers who just inspired me. So sometimes it can be a teacher, but it's normally those significant adults at home that are the ones that, so, so look good, be an advert for reading. Yeah. Sounds like good advice, definitely. You're right, yes, as you say. If I'd have been sitting on the train and you were making those sound effects, I'd have been trying to read the spine of the book and see what you were reading. Well, yeah, I've, I've done that on the underground and I and I actually banged my head on the door because I was, I was because I could see this guy and I was like, and I, I whomped, but no, I just wanted to know. And, and he was reading, in the end I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I was looking. And he was reading about Egyptology and he said, I'm just reading about how they get the brain out when they mummy and they hook it out through the nostril. Now, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't looked. I don't care anymore. And you become a mine of information at the same yes. time. You, will believe what, you would not believe what I know. Oh, dear. Love it. So, as I was going to say, you do realise, of course, now we're going to be talking about itchy bottom bears and things like this. You now. are. I've, I've, as I say, my youngest grandson is two, so he's... Oh, itchy bear would be a treat. That's exactly what I'm thinking. So, uh, George, if you're watching, because <laughs> she normally she normally does support me on this. So, oh, um, so yeah. So I guess now we come round to um, technology. Oh, um, now we're in the day and age of. You can't always turn the page, yes. Um, as I say, I'm guilty if it's um, information, so it has its uses because if it's information I can't provide and it's normally on the factual. Um, but then I have sisters that um, have ebooks, And then I have a daughter who will only, uh, who only wants hardbacks. So I know taste and situations come into play, but what are your thoughts? What are your Okay, well, I, I need to own up to the fact that um, until coronavirus, um, I, as part of the talks that I do around the world, part of it is advising on some of the dangers of technology, and there still are those dangers. But what I, I mean, I, I, I will tell you the truth, you won't tell this, but I hate having to do what I'm doing today. It's because I, I like to, to, to be able to see the whites of people's eyes. I need an audience. I need to be close. It's just just who I am. So I really struggle with technology. Um, and I, I can do emails, but not a lot else. I don't think I've ever done an attachment, and I don't intend to. And I was forced to give up my Nokia phone a year ago because... I know I, I just had to. Um, but what I first of all want to say is I know that without technology, this pandemic would have been even worse if that's imaginable. It would have been. The lack of ability to communicate would have been horrific. So I really do see, and I've always seen technology's strengths, but I missed the boat because when I was a head teacher, I had a fantastic backup team in the office who were whiz kids. Then when I started traveling around the world, I had an amazing PA with a lovely name called Jenny Rainbow. Isn't that a lovely name? And, a lovely name. And behind David's head, you can see the book dedicated to her, Mrs. Rainbow. 
Um, and she was a whiz kid. And then David, of course, I mean, I just sat here and I've been all morning I've been saying to him, don't make me press buttons, don't make me. So that aside, uh, what, what I worry about technology is this become all consuming. And I, I've seen this with my own godchildren. I go there and I can't get them to communicate with me. They're just staring. And it's more mobile phones that worry me more than anything in that they're so distracting. They spend so much time. They're losing their communication ability. And they're also getting pulled into things that worry me online. So I've got reservations. And what, what I say to parents is, please promise me your child will have smelt a book because i love smelling books mm. smelt a book caressed a book looked at the font that whole gorgeousness about holding a book now i get people at the airport oh i don't know how you could send all that carry all those oh forget a life i don't mind carrying five books in my bag on holiday oh well mine are on my kit <laughs> So what I say to parents, all for their own, but what I say to parents is, promise me they're hooked on books physically first. And then they say to me, so when do we get a Kindle? And I have to tell you the truth. I say, never would be my option. However, if you feel it's a necessity, promise me they're already a motivated reader and they're in their late teenage that's what I that that's what I am pretty passionate about. Now there will be people who will be say, oh, he's a dinosaur," but you've got to get that real feel with books first. And there's nothing I can't think of. I mean, a Kindle will do nothing for me compared to look at this book I've got. I'm reading Cider with Rosie again because I love I live I live near where Cider Slad is the village in Stroud. Now. Oh, this book, look at it. Look at the look. Oh, it's good. Now, I don't want a Kindle. I want to, oh, feel those pages. And look at the gorgeous fabric cover. You know, that's magical to me. And for me, that's something all children should experience. And what I would say is, because I've had a parent only the year before last said to me, is it okay if he's on his computer for two hours each night? And I went, what? two hours. I said, how old, how old is he? Three. Three years of age. And they now do iPads that you fit on the handles of a pushchair and a pram. They now sell them. So the child's like this the whole time. And it worries me that they're, it makes you want to say, get a life. I want them to experience the world that we are all fortunate enough to be in don't miss that moment. Um, you know, to me, I, I want to say to my godchildren, you haven't ever gone and got conquers, have you? You never made a dam in a stream. Because because I got COVID right at the very beginning and pretty ill. And so the pneumonia meant I've started to re-engage with walking and I walk miles every day. And I'm staggered of how I'm re-engaging with nature again and the world, you know, and, and it's also important when... When I was a little boy, my dad used to say the phrase, because you know the phrase, be seen and not heard, young man? I got the opposite. My dad said, now we're having visitors. You jolly well come down and talk to them. And you can tell I'm a talker. But that's because we were encouraged to, you know, I think as a human being, it's our responsibility to engage with other human beings. It's, it's an important skill. And if I walk past one more person, that's because I'm walking so much and I say, morning, and they look at me as if, what's wrong with him? What's happened? What, what has happened? And so I want children to experience real life and I want them to experience real things. And before, but I'm not saying, because don't think I don't use Google, I do. And I'm sure there are other search stations, but I do. Is that a search station engine? Search engine. But I do go to Google and I go to it to to find out things. Like I'm because of Simon Reeve, he went to Gabon, and I thought, where the heck's Gabon? And what is Gabon like? And so I, I went straight to Google. So I, I'm guilty of that. I recognise how amazing that is. But 
please limit your children's time on computers because we've seen the damage, particularly in language ability. We've got young children coming into school at the age of five who can't speak in sentences. Now that is worrying and it's because they're not communicating enough. So me and technology, you've asked the wrong person. I did, I did, I did. Now I know no, Hang on, we're feeding back again, bear with me. Um, right, um, I know that you are um, fond of extended story time. Um, explain, to, it's explain to us all about your ex extended, because I know I'm going to enjoy this, aren't I? <laughs> It's just I've always because the, the reason I'm doing the work that I'm doing now is that when I was a head teacher, I wanted to encourage the parents to a read a story well to their children, but I wanted a bit more. I wanted some role play in there. I wanted some interaction with the story. And I came up with an idea of something called a story sack. And a story sack. They were homemade, they were made by the parents in my school, they were absolutely amazing. And basically, with the book, you get the characters and props to role play the story. And obviously, these were fairly deluxe because the mums that made them put, and, and the dads put so much into them. And the children would take a different story sack home, a bit like the Seven Dwarfs. I ho, I ho, it's off to home we go. And they would take a story sack home and they'd have it for a whole week to role play the story. And the feedback we got was overwhelming, particularly the parents were saying, oh, it gave me the confidence to do the story because I had those props to do it with. And so um, the, the whole idea took off and the government then funded me for six years and I promoted it all around the world. And here I am 25 years later still doing this sort of stuff. So I don't expect parents to make a story sack. That's that's the last thing I expect. But after you've, you've had a story with the children, if there's that time and space, and certainly at home at the moment, because children are at home, you know, so much, bless their hearts, you know, I often will make masks with them or li little paper puppets on the end of a straw, and we reenact the story afterwards. And sometimes I'll go outside on the lawn and, and we'll make up bits of the story and we'll become the characters. And, and th there was a wonderful teacher recently who kept sending us because she couldn't see her. And they were children who had special needs and she knew they loved their story. Well, what that teacher did in her back garden was unbelievable. How she used her pond to perform one of my stories called The Journey, which is about a boat. And she was doing it with next to nothing, but what she created was amazing. And it's about being imagination, imaginative and going that bit of extra step. But, but after a story, and don't go on and on and on if you know your child's losing interest, but first of all, just start asking questions. Which was your favourite bit? Um, did you like this story? Who was your favourite character? And, God, do you ever get an itchy bottom like itchy bit? You know, just simple interaction because you're going to be extending their vocabulary and their talkability. Then you might do an art. When I, when I do The Hungry Caterpillar, which I, I have to say, I wish I'd written it because they sell one every six minutes somewhere <laughs> in the world. But you get to the point after 40 years that you actually, but I always have the food that he ate. You know, I say, have you ever tried salami? And I've gone and bought a bit of salami. Just, just little things when you can. You know, and it might be that you go on to Google and say, well, do bears get itchy bottoms? And if they do in the wild, where do they scratch them? You know, just making that little bit. And, and one of my stories, Florence the Flightless Fairy, is about a fairy that puts on weight because she eats too many fairy cakes. What, what a lovely chance to make a fairy cake. For, even I can make a fairy cake. And it's just when you've got the time and the passion and the energy, just take it one little step further, if you can. It'll make such a difference. And in fact, that probably leads us into me using a story sack to tell a story, looking at our timing. So would you like me to do it? I would I love, would you, love to. you to. I'm going, I'm going to, to move, move, move out, 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 more of you. Oh, not full on. How exciting. 
Okay. Well, I'm actually going to do the very first story that as an author, um, because I've now written 60 books, which I, I find hard to believe. I didn't write my first story till I was 40, and I'm now 63, so you can tell how long I've been at it. But this was the very first story. Um, and the, the reason I actually began writing is that there is a lady who's the illustrator, you have to go a different way, Judith Blake. And Judith was um, a mum of children in my, store, uh, in my school, and she was a um, wonderful art. And she was helping children in my school one day, and I said, Judith, would, would you illustrate a story for me? And she was very shy, and she said, oh, go on there. And so she illustrated, and we got it published. So this is the story of If Only. And it's a story that's about a lovely caterpillar. And this caterpillar didn't live quite in the garden. He lived underneath a little patch of weeds where there were stinging nettles. And caterpillars love stinging nettles. Well, one day it was so warm outside and he thought, oh, I think I'll, I'll come out from the shade. And when he saw the garden, he could not believe its beauty. And the first flower he spotted was a beautiful poppy. And the poppy was so lovely and red, but something was wiggling inside. And when he looked, oh, it was a bumblebee. And that little bumblebee had, oh, look, he was all stripy. And the caterpillar thought, why am I not stripy? Oh, I wish, if only I could be stripy. Look at me, I'm not stripy. So the bumblebee did a little smirk. And he said, well, I'm not staying here if you're going to laugh. But then, oh, he saw a purple iris in the pond. And there was something sparkly and glistening inside. And when he looked carefully... It was a dragonfly with sparkly wings. And the dragonfly was gorgeous. And if only I had sparkly wings and I want to be turquoise. I don't want to be just a black caterpillar. I want to be, if only. But look, there was a smile on that face of that dragonfly. So he moved on again. And this time, ooh, a pink lupin. And he thought, they're lovely. But he could hear singing inside the pink lupin. La, 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 la. Who could be singing? Oh, oh it, was, it was a grasshopper. And the grasshopper sang beautifully. And the caterpillar said, well, I can't even sing. And the grasshopper just smiled. Oh, if only. But then... The flower that caught his eye most of all was the tallest in the flower bed, a sunflower. Oh, it was so tall, he thought, I'll climb up it to see what's at the top. Oh, and he got a bit scared, but at the top, inside, yes, you've got it. Oh, it was a ladybird. And look, it was a three-spotter. Oh, I want to be a three spotter. Look at that crimson shell. Why can't I be if only I was a ladybird? Well, by now we got tired. Well, he'd been up and down, in and out. And he thought, I'll go down and I'm going to sleep inside a flower pot. And oh, in the flower pot was a gorgeous cobweb. He thought, I can't make cobwebs. If only I could be a spider but I can't. And he thought, well, I'll go to sleep in the flower pot. So he crawled over and in he went. And inside, he oh, it was a bit cold. He thought, but I'm going to let you into a secret. Did you know that when a caterpillar spins the end of its tail, little threads can come out and it can sew and it can make its own sleeping bag 
And look, the caterpillar has made, oop, I pressed a button then, David. Can you come and, and press it for me? No, it's on my screen here. Okay. okay. And see me with technology? So there, look at that. Look at that lovely, lovely sleeping bag. So he thought, I'll get inside. So he got right inside, tucked up in there. Ah, oh, and he stayed inside for 14 days and 14 nights. Well, if you'd been stuck in the sleeping bag that long, well, you, you'd get very hot. And he thought, I need to get out. So he pushed and he shoved and he wriggled and he squiggled. And he came out into the sunlight. Oh, look. What had happened to... But, oh, my goodness. He had turned into a beautiful peacock butterfly. And he said, look, I'm beautiful. If only I'd known. I, I, oh, and all the other creatures said, we all knew already. And so that little caterpillar, if he'd only waited, he'd have realised how beautiful he was. And that's the story of If Only Wendy. I can't hear you, Wendy. You've gone off. Sorry about that. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, and yes, you're right. Having those visual aids, even I was waiting to see what was going to pop out of the next flower. <laughs> so, yes. it's um, off together, Wendy. I know, it's terrible, isn't it? I, as I say, I've never grown up. Um, and poor, poor David, who... Um, I'm going to turn you on, David. Let's see what happens. <laughs> right. Even no, muting me doesn't work. Muting me doesn't work. I'm going to mute myself and see if I have to promote yourself and get your addresses out if not publicly for you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Neil, for that, that story. That was great. I hope everyone really enjoyed that. If you're interested in a few more Neil's techniques, then he has a book, Are You Sitting Comfortably, which covers all of uh, his techniques as available on our website. Um, and there's also a short DVD of, if you want more of Neil, The Joy of Reading. It's only about 20 minutes long, but it kind of covers everything that he's talked about today. Um, also on our YouTube channel, Red Robin Books, we have lots of stories um, which are free, free to view at the moment, um, of Neil doing lots of his stories. I think If Only is probably there as well. Uh, we're adding to that all the time. Um, so, th so if you want, if you're short of a story session, do go along um, and take a look at some of the some of those uh as it over 60 books lots of other things he's written as well um on our website you'll find all of his books um and i think i gave there's a little discount count code for 20 percent off um if you buy straight from us so it's rrb uh, 2021 um and that will get you uh 50 off of anything from direct from our website if you want to buy one of neil's books um Please do go ahead. There it is. It's come up on the screen. There it is. <laughs> and I'll sign them if they want to. If you want, to yeah, sign Neil. Me. Neil, you, there's a little comment box, and if you'd like it signed, then we can get Neil to sign the book for you as well. Um, so, so yeah, uh, we, can, we can still get things out at the moment. Um, even though, uh, even though we're sort of in a, in a lockdown, we, we can do that. Has Neil ever been on CBBS? No, he hasn't, but he'd love to. So if anyone from the BBC is watching. <laughs> so yeah, that, I think that's it um, for the moment. Thank you very much for having us on again. I'm talking away on mute again. I'm talking away on mute again. I'm just going to, I'm just, there we go. Right, hopefully now we've lost some feedback, a little bit of tinkering on the screen. Um, I, can I thank you both? I have had the most enjoyable morning. Um, it has been a pleasure. And hopefully 
um, further down the line, Neil, when you've got another book and time's lapsed on and we go into phase, we can then go into phase two of you. Um, and it wasn't that awful, even though it's technology and we can um, get some more promo and another story in there for the children. Um, I was right. My uh, daughter, George, is watching. Um, she's... Uh, Put, posted a comment on she loves the um, story sack idea. So I think I know what my grandson is going to uh, be getting as his next gift. Um, and I'm going to bring you in one at a time just to try and stop the feedback again. Okay, Neil, you're, you're, we can now hear you again. Okay. Okay, so it uh, sort of just leaves time now to say bye-bye. Um, I'll do it one at a time. So if we say goodbye to Neil first and thank him um, for his wonderful story and all of his advice. Um, and I'm going to say until the next time. Thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And now we're going to, there we go. There we go. We're still going to feedback, I'm afraid, David. Um, still going to feedback, afraid, David. Um, still going to feedback. Thank you for having us. Thank you for until having the next time. Until the next time. Take, care, Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And that just leaves me to say thank you all for watching. Um, watch this space. We will, um, as Neil has already agreed, we will hold him to coming back and we look forward to the further adventures. Um, have a good weekend. Keep safe. Thank you and bye-bye.